Hi, all. Joe Roller, um, CEO for Brazos, and um, really excited to be doing this presentation with y'all. Um, we're gonna be talking about the, the like uh, Josh said, the intersection of trauma and addiction, and how how they feed each other, how they correlate, and then also like how they present and ways to work through them are, are very similar. Um, in my experience, like they've been treated as like totally separate entities, so to speak. And um, and reality of it is, is they they cross in way way more ways than um, most of us realize. So I'm gonna start my PowerPoint. And uh, oh, I'm sorry. And then. We are going to be open for questions. There is a decent amount of people in here. So if your question gets missed, uh, I apologize if, if there's just a bunch flowing. Um, but I will have the chat up and I'm perfectly fine with like responding to questions as I'm discussing things. All right. All right, y'all. So like I said, uh, we're going to be talking about the intersection of addiction and trauma. Um, <clears throat> while they they intersect a lot, one of the things that like I want to emphasize is like the the highway that they're on is essentially um, it's a shame based highway. Uh, you know, there's a lot of shame that goes hand in hand with addiction. There's a lot of shame that goes hand in hand with trauma, and um, and just <clears throat> a little bit about me and how I kind of got into this. It was it was actually pure happenstance. Um, I was working at a center really didn't have any interest, uh, so to speak, in working with trauma. We had trauma, we had dedicated trauma therapists there. And, um, and next, you know, like everything shifted and we needed to like implement some trauma work. And coincidentally, I was going to a seminar that weekend and ended up sitting in on a class about a trauma protocol that can be super personalized, which really grabbed my attention. Cause that's kind of like how psychology was built. It was built off of like personalizing things somebody puts something out somebody says man i like that but i want to adjust it and uh and so that with that protocol could be done that way and i loved it and it's it's called a uh, cognitive processing therapy and i just think cbt um because cpt is actually a part of cbt and that just goes really well with recovery because you know one of the main goals in recovery is the complete psychic change and cbt is a lot about that right it's if I change how I think, I change how I feel, I change how I show up. And uh, and they just, they, they coincide so well. I was like, man, this is perfect. And uh, so we implemented it and it went really well. Got some really good feedback. Um, clients got some really good, uh, some really good experience with the work and also a lot of relief. And it just kind of took off from there. And next thing I know, I was like, I'm kind of the trauma guy. And it's been an honor to do that. And it's been an amazing experience. Um, <clears throat> so another thing about me is... I have what's been what's been coined the uh, resting Joe face. Um, a lot of times I'm just sitting at like my norm and people think I'm angry, um, but I'm not. It's just I just look like this It's a genetic thing. And just as an example, uh, my four th my four month old has the same face. Right. If you if you catch her just as normal, you're like, man, she's angry. Um, but she, but she's not. She's she's really Beautiful. she's really sweet. Thank you. And uh, but as we interact we liven up. Right. So it's just, it's a genetic thing. It's, it's, we, we can't control it, but when we're just sitting still, like we, we tend to look angry. Um, so if you experience that, don't worry about it. I just look that way. And again, feel free to ask questions, feel free to interact. So, um, moving on. Okay. My thing ain't working. So moving into the objectives. So we're going to pretty much hit four objectives, right? And I'm not going to read these verbatim, but essentially what we want to talk about is just Get everybody on the same page with like symptoms and responses of trauma and how those go hand in hand with the cycle of addiction. Then we're going to talk about some interventions to utilize, um, especially in an instance where like it feels uncertain what's presenting. Like I hear that a lot of times. It's like, well, I don't want to like hold too much space or be too compassionate because this is not trauma. This is just, you know, the addict brain showing out and, you know, and we need to address that differently. And the reality of it is, is, <clears throat> they present very similar. And if we go in too abruptly because we think it's an addiction thing versus a trauma thing, we could actually cause damage. Um, so building off of those interventions, we're gonna talk about some some solution skills to follow up those interventions. And uh, and then at the end, just how to integrate a whole team, um, especially in a treatment center setting. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about how to do that. If you're a private practice, if you're like, cool, that sounds amazing in a treatment center, but I don't, I don't have this whole team. Um, so we'll talk about how to integrate that as well. Um, and then at the end, we'll open up for a little bit more questions. But again, feel, feel free to ask questions as we're going along. So 
what is trauma, right? A lot of people have their own definitions and um, understanding. And just through working with clients and like saying, okay, well, this is what trauma is. And, you know, and, and their feedback is like, man, that doesn't really fit me, uh, things like that. So over the years, one of the most inclusive definitions I found is the one that's on the screen. It's, it's just an experience that negatively affects how someone views their self, others, and society. Um, and it continues to impact them in the present, right? And if you think about the idea of like addiction, the, the things that like lead to addiction, the lifestyle within addiction, it's the same thing, right? That that really affects how somebody views their self. It really affects how they view others and uh, society. And as the nature of addiction, because there's not really, a, there's not a cure for it. There's solutions for sure. But there's not a cure. So it's going to continue to affect them in the present. And trauma is very similar. There's not, there's not a, there's not a cure for trauma as far as, you know, my, my clinical perspective. I think there's a set of skills that a person can then learn and adapt so that they can work through it and the power that it has over them, you know, diminishes and their ability to rebound from when it comes up increases. But uh, as far as like just going in and waving a wand, like, man, you don't have trauma no more. That's, that's not really a thing. Um, so that's just kind of the definition that I like to function by. And then going into the symptoms, um, the symptoms we have is, you know, re-experiencing arousal and avoidance, and these break down into their own things. And if, if it feels like I'm rushing through this, my, my, you know, I just want to kind of cap these because the information we're going to get into is going to build on this, but it's not specifically about this. So the symptoms we have with trauma is re-experiencing. Um, re-experiencing is about intrusive thoughts, about intrusive memories, um, flashbacks, dreams. Um, and those dreams can kind of break up into a couple of ways because one of the things is, is like <clears throat> the avoidance of trauma is like at all times. Like, how do I distract? How do I keep my mind busy? How do I keep things out of my head? And uh, and during during dreams is when we can't do that. Like all of our defenses are down. The subconscious comes out to play. And sometimes those are very like explicit and make sense. And sometimes they're super abstract. So whenever I talk to clients, I kind of break those down into two categories. Like we got nightmares is when it's like you're reliving your trauma and your dreams. And then we got uh, symbolic dreams or abstract. They don't really make sense. But if we think about the feelings or the experience of the dream, then it's like, man, that kind of reminds me of the trauma. Um, and then. Honestly, when I talk to clients, I don't really use the, the clinical word symbolic. I actually say shitty. It's a shitty dream because um, you kind of just wake up and you're like, wow, that, that really sucked. Um, and it doesn't really make sense. But when we get down into the, the deeper meaning of it, it's like, OK, this this relates. Um, and then arousal. Arousal is where like hypervigilance comes in, um, just heightened startle response, concentration issues and irritability. Um, and the reason why is because in arousal, the hypervigilance, is all about like trying to prevent the trauma from happening again, trying to prevent re-experiencing from coming up. So paying attention to everything so that somebody can try to stay safe and, uh, and it's exhausting and it's, it's just not necessarily uh, sustainable, which is where avoidance comes in. Because when I can't avoid through the hypervigilance and keeping everything at bay and all that, then it, then the thing is I just disconnect. I completely check out and, you know, check out through several ways, you know, drugs, alcohol, um, sex, overworking out, um, eating, shopping, so many things. And, uh, and then also really trying to get into the idea of how do I not keep history from repeating? So people will avoid certain places, certain situations, certain jobs, um, things like that. Cause the mind is so set on, this is a never ending loop. This trauma will repeat or it will come up that they kind of set their life up to where it minimizes the chances of that happening. And what that leads us into is kind of the responses. So when we get into the responses, obviously one of the responses with trauma is fight, flight, or freeze. And that gets embedded into the experience of what it felt like before, during, and after. And the body starts to look for those responses. And as soon as it feels like it's going into fight, flight, or freeze, the avoidance kicks in, these, these belief systems kick in, the maladaptive behaviors kick in, and it's all about the idea of essentially trying to stay safe. Because um, the trauma just, for the most part, showed them that they're not safe. And if it wasn't the first time, it was a reminder, right? Um, but usually it's just an experience that says, I'm not okay. I don't know how to be okay. I can't protect myself. I can't protect others, whatever the case may be. And so 
a lot of these belief systems are kind of built from hindsight. It's based on the shoulda, woulda, coulda. If I should have done this, I could have done that. And it's all in the essence of if I'd have done these things, this wouldn't have happened. If I'd have done this, that wouldn't have happened. Um, and then so they put those into practice and it becomes maladaptive. So an example of a couple of belief systems would be um, I should have known he or she would hurt me. Right. And you think about the mindset of that and the behaviors that go hand in hand with that and how they're going to show up in relationships, how they're going to show up in dynamics with others. And um, and the whole thing is like, I need to keep people from getting close because they're going to hurt me. And if I see one little indication that that person reminds me of the one that hurt me, then avoidance kicks in like hardcore. Um, going hand in hand with that is must be on guard at all times. Um, also, like must control everything that happens to me. and this is all again in the essence of like, how do I prevent this trauma from happening again? Or how do I prevent like my re-experiencing from coming back up? And, um, and when they go through this, like a lot of these belief systems get, get structured from, from blame. Right. And we can blame ourselves, and we can blame others. Um, we tend to lean towards one more than the other, but we can absolutely do both. Um, and one of the ways I help people understand like which one they're kind of more geared towards is pretty simple. Uh, example so most people that interact with me you know like when i walk down the hall even if i saw you just two minutes ago i'm gonna still say hey what's up something um and once they've experienced that i mean it would be really odd if i was walking down the hallway and i said nothing to that person and so my question would be is if we're walking down the hall and we make eye contact we look at each other and there's no question that we saw each other and i don't say hi i don't say what's up and you do and i don't respond and i keep walking internally what messages are going to come up and um and it's kind of a mixed bag but it goes towards the different ways of, of blame it's going to be oh man he must be mad at me i must have did something wrong or you know what i knew it he's he's a jerk you know he's just not a nice guy um and what we're looking at is is when somebody's going to the idea of like i must have did something wrong he's mad at me that's somebody's like their go-to is self-blame whereas if they go towards like well i knew it he's just he's a jerk or whatever thing like that um that's the one that's going towards blame of, of uh, others. And again, they can absolutely do both, but we're usually going to go to one um, as kind of our go-to. So in that maladaptive behavior with that example would be tit for tat. Next time I see him, if he says hi, I'm not going to say nothing. Um, another maladaptive behavior would be to confront. Hey, man, I just said something to you. You're not going to say hi to me, you know? And what gets lost in that is the idea that like, the world is bigger than us. Because in that moment, if I was to turn to that person and say, man, I, I'm sorry. I, I mean, I saw you, but I was actually trying to remember a phone number and I wanted to go write it down. And I just kept saying it to myself about it broke my concentration. I lost it. Um, so I'm sorry. How you doing? Now I got to go re-remember this number. And in that moment, I'm like, they're going to feel bad, which is also going to like go into the shame. Um, so just a brief example on how these belief systems kind of feed um, maladaptive behaviors so um do we have any questions at this point i saw a couple people chiming in i'm just going to scroll make sure i didn't miss anything just a reminder guys i will send the powerpoint out i promise <laughs> thanks crystal all right <clears throat> so building from that how does trauma coincide with addiction um Control. Control is one of the biggest ways, right? Um, if you think about the aspect of trauma, arguably 99.9% 9 .9 of the time, it's out of that person's control. Um, and, it, and it shakes up the world on what they actually have control of. And then the the wake of that is even more uh, lack of control, because then it's a real it's a real experience in how much I don't have control over my mind, which is which is mind blowing to us because we I can control my body. I can control my hands. I can control what I'm saying, but I can't control what's popping up in my mind. I can't control these beliefs. I can't control these thoughts, these memories. Um, and so I need to figure out how to deal with that. And we try through so many ways. And it's like, if I want to change what I'm thinking, you know, I try to redirect and it keeps coming back. And, you know, that's what makes them intrusive. Same thing with the memories. Um, just like people with the circumstances. And uh, so sometimes the solutions ends up being things that are uh, unhealthy coping, which can turn into addiction. And it can go from, again, it can go from like shopping to food to, you know, sex, relationships, um, all the way to drugs and alcohol. And obviously, the, the point we're talking about today is drugs and alcohol. 
so what a what a perfect solution to controlling how I feel and think. Like I can't control what's going on in my body. Let's numb it out. If I can't control these emotions, then let me numb it out, you know? And if I want to get to the points where like, I don't want the stuff in my head to bother me, then I can numb it out. Uh, same thing with interacting with people in places. You know, if I, if I go into these environments and I don't want to like feel some sort of way about it, let's, let's throw something in the system. Um, that's going to help me bring down that inhibition, those nerves and everything else. And then makes you know, it's like, wow, this is working. Um, and it is, and it's, it's the solution until it's the problem. And, um, but it feeds the control, right? And the next thing you know, you're dealing with some, some substance abuse issues, maybe all the way towards addiction. Um, and then also trauma, which the whole thing is geared towards, I need to control everything because I'm not safe, I'm not all right. And then when I finally get to the point where I can't handle that no more, then I just want to check out. I don't even want to deal with the idea that I'm not okay, I'm not safe. So <clears throat> essentially, what do we want to control? Or I guess our clients want to control is everything. And that is exhausting, which also feeds addiction because when it's all said and done, like trying to control everything, trying to um, manipulate, set the game, set the table, all of that, it's just, it ends up being overwhelmingly exhausting. And so then they retreat, right? And this is where you hear about people being held up in a dark room and, and just getting um, just getting messed up, right? Just their addiction is running rapid. So what we're going to look at is IFS, right? IFS has protective parts. Um, I like to call them trauma stage characters. I don't know if that's original thought or not, but I use the word uh, terms stage characters because that just goes hand in hand with addiction. You know, they get a lot of information on their stage characters, how they're showing up, how they're presenting in different ways, in different situations with different people. And if you think about it, it's, it's a protective measure, right? Because their trauma, their addiction has shown them that showing up authentically is not safe, right? Showing up in a vulnerable manner is not safe. So I need a representative. Um, and trauma does the exact same thing. So one of the stage characters is the exile, right? And when we're talking about control, exile represents the, the loss of control, right? So in that, that's where the trauma, the trauma lives. So this is where people get flooded with the emotions, the thoughts, the feelings, everything that they have not been able to or not willing to uh, deal with or not even willing, maybe not even had the opportunity or the ability to like deal with it. So everything is put in this box of like, I can't deal. When this comes up, I cannot deal. And <clears throat> with that, something has to deal with it. So in comes the firefighter, right? And the firefighter takes control but it's reactive, right? It comes in after the fact. And it's usually very, pretty abrupt and it's usually pretty destructive. Um, and that doesn't mean that it always leads straight to a, addiction um, or drug use or anything like that, but it can build to that because sometimes it's just aggression, right? The exile comes up, they feel a loss of control. The firefighter kicks in and says, you know what, if I get aggressive with this person, they will back up, right? Um, they will absolutely back up. And, or, if I'm dealing with things and I just want to change how I feel, but mindset isn't all the way to using drugs or alcohol, then you know what? Let me let me get on Tinder. Let me let me find somebody to help me forget about what's going on. Um, and so this can this can go back and forth, right? And then um, so I'm seeing a few questions about IFS. So IFS is, and some people respond, and I appreciate that. Uh, it's internal family systems, right? It's a, it's a school of thought. It's a modality from from a uh, for psychology, clinical, whatever you want to call it. And um, it's, it's about systems, right? Family systems, uh, work systems, all kinds of systems. And in that, we have these, these parts and the ways that we show up. Um, and it's about being protective because when we're in there and we're in a vulnerable state, it can bring us back to places of being harmed, which would rep represent the exile. So what do we do? Other representatives have to kick in because exile says, I can't deal. This is not I, this is something I can't control. And it shuts down and another part has to step in and say, I got you. Um, and a lot of that is fed from the IFS perspective um, from needs. Right. They, they talk about how a lot of this is driven by uh, met and unmet needs. Right. So, for example, let's say one of my parts is having a, um, a, a decent sense of humor and being and pretty ambitious. Right. And when my needs are met, th those are present, right? But as soon as my needs aren't being met, those go away. 
And then it's okay. Well, here comes out aggression, and here comes out, um, you know, uh, man, my mind went blank. <clears throat> so here comes aggression, and then also here comes like the idea of like not caring, right? So when those two parts come out, then there's some needs underneath there that are that are not being met, and so those parts have to pop out. And these parts that we're talking about here are essentially the parts that that come out in response to our trauma, unresolved trauma, and things like that. So, um, yeah, so back to the firefighter, right? So it's control, it's reactive. And honestly, like to visualize this, and if you look at the picture of the exile, it's this little, it looks like a little girl, a little girl that's like just balled up. And that's what the trauma is. It is it's like balled up and in the corner. And that's where the pain and the hurt is. Um, but from time to time it comes out, right? But it usually comes out pretty abruptly. And the firefighter's whole job is to push that exile back in the corner because we don't want to deal with you. We don't want to see you. You're overwhelming. You flood the system and you cause you cause issues. Um, and the firefighter, this is the delusion of it. They don't see, they doesn't see this as harmful. It's, it's its job, right? The job is to put this exile back in the corner because the exile is a problem. You're the reason why we can't deal. Um, and then once the firefighter finishes their job, the manager pops out. The manager takes control and it's more of a proactive, right? Granted, it's coming after the firefighter, but it is a proactive thing. It's proactive in the sense of how do I keep the exile hidden? How do I keep it in this corner? And it's literally just standing in front of the exile in the corner with everything going on, just trying to orchestrate everything so nobody looks at the exile and also keeps it blocked off in the corner. Um, this goes hand in hand with one of the symptoms for hypervigilance, right? The, ma the managers where hypervigilance is at its highest. Cause I got to see everything coming. I got to prevent all these issues. I got to stay on top of everything. So nothing uh, sets off the exile and exile comes running out and then lose control. And then the whole system kicks over again. Then the firefighter has to come in. And when we're back to the manager, once the firefighter's done with their destructive um, part. So <clears throat> building from that, we have the cycle of addiction, right? And the cycle of addiction um, is on your screen now. And Arguably, it kicks off in so many different ways, but uh, but we're just going to kick from the top where it says use, right? So somebody uses a substance and their physical allergy, their phenomenon of craving kicks off. And this is where um, the power of choice gets lost, right? And um, and I know not everybody um, believes that. It's, it's, it's a school of thought and everything like that. And if, if, you, if you don't believe it, that's fine. Um, but <clears throat> for the, the purposes of what we're talking about today, this is where um, the person loses control, right? Without something stepping in or someone stepping in to remove them from that, um, chances are they're going to keep using, right? Which then brings us to the spree. This is where power of choice is completely lost. Like they're, if it's alcohol, drugs, whatever, they're just, they're just going and it becomes very destructive, very destructive. Um, and then once that comes to a stopping point, then they emerge remorseful. It's like, man, I can't believe I did that. That's horrible. All these things, you know, um, this is where shame comes back in. This is where, you know, the trauma comes back in. And chances are there was things that happened during that spree that brought in more trauma and more shame. But <clears throat> following that goes a firm resolution, right? This is where I'm going to do all these things. I got all these plans. I got all these ideas to where this doesn't happen again. Um, and, and they'll try to maintain that for a while. And then it gets to be too much. Right. And this is where restless, irritable discontent comes in. Right. All of a sudden, everything gets on my nerves. All of a sudden, everything is a problem and it keeps pushing and pushing until they get into the mental obsession. The mind starts to say, well, I know what will fix this. I know what can deal with this. I know what will help it to where we don't care about these things. Right. And without that being intervened on, then the first use could happen. And then the whole cycle kicks off again. So. Um, <clears throat> As we were working on this and implementing and talking to clients about it, things like that, and just reading on it, um, I noticed that the IFS stage characters lined up really well with this. So if you think about the idea of the exile, so I'll start with the exile, right? Restless, irritable, discontented, and a mental obsession, right? This is where a person gets to the place where they can't deal. This is where the loss of control is happening. Um, and that'll go. And if it's unchecked, if there's not skills to implement to kind of, you know, keep that that um, at a tolerable state. Right. Because we have thresholds for trauma and what people can handle and what they can work through. The, the firefighter has to kick in. Right. 
So once the firefighter kicks in, this is where, you know, going hand in hand with a cycle addiction is like, it's like the first use, right? And again, that first use in the example of the IFS is not always drugs and alcohol. Sometimes it's sex. Sometimes it's working out too much. Um, sometimes it's food, right? Sometimes it's aggression. And if that doesn't get checked or it doesn't work, then it's going to evolve and evolve and evolve and it can go all the way. Um, and then once that runs its course, then a manager kicks in just like emerge remorseful. like, man, I can't believe that happened. I can't believe these things got so bad. I got the plan. I know what I need to do to fix this. Everything's fine. Uh, I'm going to start going to these meetings. I'm, I'm going to start working with this therapist. I'm going to do all these things and it's going to be great. Um, and because of the, the, the struggles with trauma and addiction, a lot of times they want to do that on their own. And it doesn't, it doesn't work like that. There are people that can and hats off to them, right? But most people, they need support. They need a community. They need a system around them to help them work through these things. Um, when a restless, irritable discontent starts to kick back in, the exile is starting to come out. And then now you now we can't deal and the whole cycle just kicks over again. Um, so <clears throat> a lot of times people talk about how trauma and addiction go hand in hand. And honestly, like this is one of the best ways I've seen that shows how much they feed each other. And I just want everybody to keep in mind that what I'm not saying is that if somebody works through their trauma, then they don't go into the cycle of addiction no more. Absolutely not. Right. But what I am saying is if you can get to a place, if somebody can get to a place of resolution with their trauma and having the skills to work through it, this is one less thing kicking off this cycle of addiction. Um, and it's also giving them skills that boil over into handling their addiction because there are things that trigger the addiction. You know, well, you know, and I know some people don't believe in triggers and things like that, but there are things that people experience that their mind, like a trigger, sets off and says, man. Getting high right now would solve all this. Drinking right now would solve all this. And the difference between somebody being able to work through those cravings or not is having skills or having the right people around them until they implement those skills. Um, and it's the same thing with trauma. Trauma is going to come up. Trauma is going to get triggered. And the difference is when that happens, do you have the skills to work through it or not? Or do you have the people around you to support you until you get through that? Um, and that's a big determining factor between people being successful in working through their trauma and working through addiction is, is support, right? Um, <clears throat> so interventions. So some of the interventions we're going to talk about are kind of build off uh, trauma-informed care. Um, this is stuff that pretty much anybody can do. And obviously, like if, if you're a therapist, like it helps in the moment and things like that. Um, but <clears throat> you, you would have to up the ante a little bit to like actually get them working through, through this stuff. Um, so actually, hold on, I'm going to slide back. Somebody had a question. <laughs> so I got two good questions. Yes, people really do not believe in triggers. Um, I've heard that several times when it's like, hey, you know, somebody's triggered. Like, oh, triggers don't exist. Um, and the thing is, is like, I understand the, the concept that they're coming from. So like, for example, would be if triggers are such a real thing, um, a, a heroin addict would never be able to eat cereal because they have to use a spoon. And then you see a spoon, then that could trigger, you know, um, addiction. But it's still a trigger because there is a chance that maybe not every time, but there's going to be times we're going to look at a spoon and it's going to it's going to bring up a memory. Right. Um, same thing with alcohol, you know, and they're everywhere. And it doesn't mean it's not a trigger because it's everywhere. But like they see a billboard for Bud Light and they had a day. Right. And like, man, Bud Light would be great today. Um, that's essentially a trigger because their mind is just snapped to that. And it's like this would solve it. Um, but again, like I said earlier, the difference is can they work through that or not? Um, Another question was, could I explain the physical allergy? So hands down, the best explanation I've ever heard of the uh, physical allergy is the idea of just having an allergy, right? So um, let's say you're allergic to, to bees, right? Um, if a bee stings you, you it's going to turn red. It's going to swell up, everything like that. Chances are you might even go all the way to where like you're kind of sick, like holds like flu symptoms, right? Um, so the concept here is that Drugs and alcohol is the same thing when somebody um, is an actual is an addict. Like they have the issue of like not being able to control it, right? So they put that substance in their body, and there's a large reaction. The idea of like losing control. So thinking that somebody could control that is the same idea of controlling a bee sting, right? I know I'm allergic to this. I know I'm gonna have a reaction to this, and I know I can't control it. But this time is gonna be different. So when the bee stings me. I'm a will, I'm gonna use my self will and I'm a will it to not react. My skin is not gonna turn red. I am not gonna swell up. 
Um, and you are, if you're allergic to it, you're allergic to it. Um, and that's not to say that there's actual like aller allergic reaction to, uh, to uh, drugs and alcohol, but it's just the concept of it, right? You already have the experience that you don't have control and the idea that you're going to do it again and then be able to control at that time, but I'm going to do it again and be able to control at that time. is the same as like trying to control allergic reactions to like a bee sting. Um, so <clears throat> I hope that answers that question. All right, going into the interventions, right? So biggest thing we can do is hold space and be present. Um, on, on the recovery side, you know, one of the, this goes hand in hand with the idea of pause, right? Um, just, just having some pause because when somebody's trauma is triggered, they're, they're not thinking rationally, right? Arguably, there's two ways we reason, emotionally and logically. Um, but when trauma is triggered, logic's out the window. Um, it's, it's complete emotional reasoning. And if that moment you come in and you try to logically reason with somebody, it, it's just not going to go well. And then you also got to consider like the idea that the firefighters coming out, the idea that all these belief systems are just rampant. Um, and <clears throat> so if we can hold space, because most people eventually their, their nervous system is going to start to level out. Right. Especially if we're not doing things to like continue to, to set it off. Um, so just being in a whole space to them and be present, being present is super important because they're they're pretty sensitive to, to what's going on around them. And if you're there with them, but it's very obvious, like you have other things you could be doing or somewhere else you could go, um, that, that's going to further trigger them. It's also going to further feed the shame of like, I'm not good enough. People don't care. I'm not OK. Um, so just being in a whole space and be present. Um, and big part of that is just the idea of mutual respect, right? Being sensitive to what, you know, they're going through, their experience, not only currently, but also historically, right? And in that moment, it's not the time for like, what's wrong, if it's delusional or not. It's just the idea of like, just hearing people out. And then as the nervous system calms down, you'll see them kind of relax. And that's the time to kind of start switch gears into some, some logic, right? But it, when they're still escalated and you can see their breathing and their heart rate, most of the time, logic is not not the time to be applying that right there. Um, so once once they relax, right, then you're going to be able to connect to them in, in a different manner. And this is where the uh, the intervention can come in for trauma informed care. One of the ones I like is the empowerment model. It's pretty simple. It's only pretty much got five steps to it. And uh, the thing is, if anybody's familiar with this, you're probably going to notice that it's in a different order. And that's just because the way I see it and the way I've interacted with clients. It, it, for me, it flows better in this order. So one of the first things is just is just understanding, right? Connecting to and relating to what they're currently going through, right? And this is, you know, in, in treatment, they like to say cosign people's bullshit. Um, and not to that extent, right? You, you, you can still connect with somebody, you can still be present with them and understand what they're going through and not cosign their delusions, right? Not be like, oh, you know, not go along with them and everything like that. But at the same time, you don't have to challenge it in that moment. Um, so really just connecting to them and understand what's going on and, and that's letting them get the energy out too. They're processing it. They're talking about it. And, uh, and it's going to help the, the nervous system calm down. Next thing is normalizing, normalizing what they're going through. Let's say they had a reaction to somebody at work or in a group setting. And as they're explaining it, plus what it triggered from their past, like, man, that, that makes sense. Like I don't went through that. I, I probably would have had the same reaction, you know, and what you're going to notice is, is that's going to help calm them down because they're not going to feel like they're the only one. They're not going to feel crazy. They're, you know, and it's just going to help them chill out. And then you can bring in some coping skills, right? Which is the next bullet. Teaching them some coping skills, right? Some in the moment coping skills because so many things can be coping skills like going to the gym, cooking dinner. But if I'm in the middle of like the work day or I'm in a treatment setting and, you know, there's stuff going on, like that is not the time to say, hey, I'm feeling really, really dysregulated right now. And my coping skill is, is, is cooking uh, dinner. So I'm going to head home and I'm going to cook dinner, eat, clean up, and I'll be back. Like That's not the time for that. But it is a time for some immediate coping skills, like breathing, grounding, you know, just taking a little walk, uh, you know, things like that. And then getting them to implement that, which also helps the nervous system come down. And then the next thing we want to do is bring in some resources, right? Remind them of the resources they have, the resources that you are, the person in front of them to help them work through this, to help them lean on other, other people and processes and the fact that like they don't have to do this alone. And that's going to help as well, which 
pretty much boils right into the next, right? The collaboration of it, right? We just want to maximize their choices to be okay and to work through this. And you'll also notice, depending on where they're at with like working through their trauma response, um, or if even it's, if it's a craving type deal, um, some of their choices are going to feel not like an option. And you're going to find that you got to keep like throwing different things. And that's okay. Because we just want to maximize what their choices are to be okay, right? You can go talk to this person or we can go see this person or we can, you know, we can go do a 10 step or we can do some inventory or we can do this little quick DBT sheet or we can do none of that and just sit here and breathe and, and look at these birds flying by. Um, whatever needs to happen in that moment. But we also got to remember that the, the, the process that they're going through right then, like their brain, their prefrontal cortex is not firing correctly. So they're not going to be able to bring in all these options on their own. And we just got to, you know, go through them until one sticks and it helps that person calm down. Um, and then the collective of this is we're trying to get away from victimhood, right? Without using that word, you definitely don't want in that moment, but like, man, you're being a victim. Um, now, once rapport is established and things like that, and you had that kind of connection with that person and, and you know them well enough to where they calm down, you can have that uh, dialogue and that's different. But for the most part, you don't want to blame man, you're being a victim because it's 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 going to just re, re, uh, reinforce some of the beliefs and thoughts they're having in their head. But we want to overcome victimhood, victimhood in the sense of like, this is always going to happen. I'm always going to deal with this. I'm not going to be able to deal. I'm never going to be OK. And it's like, man, it's not true. Right. You can be OK. And part of like the resources and the coping skills and the collaboration and the normalizing is helping them find out what can work for them and get through it, right? Because the reality of it is, if you go back to the definition I used from trauma, using that definition, arguably 100% of people with addiction for sure have experienced some sort of trauma. But I would say arguably, we've all had some sort of traumatic experience in our life, right? Because we've all had things happen that was out of our control that changed the way we view ourselves, others in society. And we still think about it in the present. Um, now, how much power that has over us is, is very individualized, right? But we, we all can tap into something and be empathetic and normalize it. And I get it, you know, and maybe our experience in that is like being shamed for wearing like a ridiculous outfit in, in middle school, you know, and we still think about it from time to time, but it's not debilitating. But we can connect to that to say, man, I know what it's like to have people kind of like ridicule you to where it's like, I don't feel safe or comfortable being myself, you know? You don't have to get into the weeds of what your experience was to be able to connect to what they're going through. Um, so building from that, using the multi, multi, multidisciplinary team, right? If you're in a treatment setting, you got all kinds of options, right? You got direct care staff, techs, whatever you might call them. Um, you got case managers, recovery people would usually do the 12 step or smart recovery, whatever the case may be. We got counselors and therapists and we got a medical team, right? Part of maximizing this is also like, in that moment, there might be a tech that they're most comfortable with. And they're like, you know what? The only person I want to talk to is, is Jefferson. You know, Jefferson's a tech that's on shifts. Like, cool, man, let's get Jefferson over here. I'm, I'm going to text him. I'm going to get him over here. Um, you know, and then just, hey, after that, like, let's follow up with the case manager. Let's follow up with these people. Like, getting these, getting them connected to these people to feel good. Um, and the biggest thing that's available to them and it's the most um, beneficial resource is their community. Um, getting them tapped into their community because they're going to hear things from us, but when when they can hear from a peer that they're going to be all right and they're going to feel supported by a peer, I mean that that carries so much weight. Um, and if you're in a private practice setting, I know you're not every day surrounded by this complete multidisciplinary team, but we want to try to replicate that, right? Because we also don't want clients to be therapist dependent. So we need to maximize the things they can utilize outside of sessions, um, and then just encourage to follow through. You know, um, same time, but not like say it in a way that comes across disappointing. Oh, you didn't follow up with the psychiatrist. Oh, oh, you didn't go talk to your sponsor. Um, you know, cause that's going to bring up the shame of like, they're not good enough. They're not doing what they need to do to be well, more or less. We want to encourage them. Like, man, if you know, we want to get through this and you want to change this, like, you know, we got to bring these people in. We have to seek these people out and these people are around you cause they care and they want to help. So let's utilize that. Let's bring these people in and let them help you. Um, and also normalize the idea that like, it feels uncomfortable to bring these people in, but that's what a support system and that's what a community is, right? It's people that we can have that conversation with and get that support. And it doesn't have to be the whole world. You know, a lot of people don't want to air their dirty laundry, so to speak, to the whole world. And that's perfectly fine. You don't need to do it to the whole world. You need to do it to your circle that can support you to get through this because that's how we get well. Um, so, yeah, <clears throat> so that's kind of where we're at with that. And 
just want to open it up for questions. I know uh, towards the end there, I started talking pretty fast because I, I saw the time was ticking down. But um, but that is just the major ways that I've experienced how trauma and addiction kind of coincide and, and intersect. And again, this a lot of this is on the highway of shame. You know, shame is uh, so powerful and it plays a role not only in addiction, but also in, in trauma. And uh, the most powerful thing we can do with somebody is hold space, be present, and just normalize what they're going through. And man, the, the change you'll see within five, 10, 15 minutes of that person's nervous system and to be able to get to them to get some get some help, it's it's amazing. So so I appreciate y'all. Again, if y'all got any questions, um, I'm watching the chat and I see Crystal has jumped back in. Welcome back, Crystal. Hi. So I will turn I'm it over to you. asking if you would put the addiction cycle slide up again. Yeah, yeah. Right there. Yep. And this addition cycle, um, there's variations to it. People people do it differently. And uh, but this is just one of the ways that has been kind of a common theme through many of the places I've worked with and people I've worked with. That's that's pretty relatable and spot on because I mean there's there's other terms that can go in here, you know, like instead of use, first use, um, there's spiritual malady, there's there's several things that can go in here, but um, so this is one I like to use. I'm just monitoring to see if we've, we did ask, someone asked if the slides would have your recorded voice. No, the slides will just be slides. We did record the presentation and at some point it might end up on YouTube, but, um, that's all I'm going to say with that. Just. I'm behind on that stuff. So does Brazos offer anything other than a 12 step model? That's a question. That yes. Often. Yes. Um, so <clears throat> we have implemented a DBT um, curriculum for our, um, for our like first 30 days. And after that, they're going into a CBT model, which is for the last 60 days. And um, so, yeah, so <clears throat> part of that is just DBT. Um, it's really good for where they're at in that first 30 days. It's not too complex and everything like that. And, um, and yeah, and our clinical director is an amazing, amazing psychologist with a lot of experience, uh, Dr. Julie Miriam. And she, she, uh, she wrote the curriculum, she implemented it and she's implementing the CBT one as well. And we just want it to kind of scaffold into that. Um, and then also just working with them with where they're at in those first 30 days of recovery, because they're not always completely clear those 30 days. And we don't want to get too complex with them on a bunch of you know in-depth CBT work. But we do want to evolve into that so they, they can have more skills. Um, so Zach asked, um, so in this, course in this, <laughs> in the cycles, you explained <laughs> how the symptoms of addiction and a trauma response intersect. How do the solutions or interventions intersect? Yeah. So I, I think the solutions intersect as well. You know, um, one of the biggest skills when somebody's, you know, struggling with cravings and, and trying to keep people in the seat, so to speak, and, and to not go relapse or use, um, is motivational interviewing, right? And, um, and if you think about the empowerment model, I went over, like, it's motivational interviews all through that, right? So it's like, we want to connect with that person. We want to find out what they're struggling with. We also want to find out what is driving them to be well and, and, and pretty much, you know, take off with that so we can get them back motivated and encouraged to, like, overcome. And uh, so I think, and whether that person is dealing with a trauma trigger or craving or whatever, I think using that um, trauma informed model, like if we connect with that person, because if they're struggling with a trauma trigger or just a craving to get high, if you go through that, those, that process, you're going to see that like the ability to connect and, and uh, get that person thinking about some solution is going to be really good. Okay. I'm trying to read this question. Sorry. Go for it. Uh, since it can, I close a lot. I'm not sure where that IFS is. Include a family. Okay. I understand that. Um, okay. I'm like, do you see yeah. what I'm seeing? Okay. <laughs> so not early, but it, I mean, just depending on the dynamics and the, uh, 
um, the proximity of the client and how involved the family is, I, I think at some point, yes, bringing in the family would be beneficial. Um, Cause also like, we got to think about the idea that like, is not only is, is the family system, like a, a whole system, obviously I'm being redundant, but um, addiction is a family issue, you know? So it, it doesn't do a whole lot for the client, so to speak, to get well. And then the family system is still sick. Cause when they go back into that system, it's going to trigger things. It's going to bring things up. So we need that family to, you know, be on a pathway of getting well also. And, um, but more than anything, it's, it's about teaching the client about how their system interacts. And, um, and then when they're dealing with their parts in their family, right. Their, their mom could have several parts, you know, and the thing is, is like, and it's not saying it's okay, but like, say mom is, is abusive, right. Um, maybe just emotionally abusive. And it's like, okay, well, what, what unmet needs are happening to where she's tapping into that. Right. And it's not saying that they're responsible for that, but also being able to understand it so that there's ways they can navigate and function within that system and try to be more safe. Um, so I think, I think it's kind of a twofold answer there. It's like, we definitely want to get the client to understand their system and how it works and how to navigate that and stay safe and stay healthy and, and, and heal. And when it's appropriate, bring the family in as well. So that system can heal as a whole. We've had a couple of things. I can see, um, we've got a few more minutes and then we're going to sign off. I completely resonate with the need to clear the shame. What I find with clients is the shame is very deep. It is surrounded by defenses that are hard uh, to get veneer. past. It's under the yeah. veneer of everything is fine. Any tips? Yeah, I think, um, you know, kind of through some some uh, guided questions and things like that. When I say guided, like we're, we're very direct and, and directive in the sense of like, there's a place I want to get. But um, a lot of times just just flat out asking those questions, uh, their defenses are going to be up. They're not going to tap into some some more uh, deeper things. So I think it's just sharing their experience with how everything's fine and having them explain things and, and just kind of just reflecting things that don't sound fine, you know, um, because when they're hearing it in their head versus hearing it out loud from another person, sometimes like, okay, now that, now that, you, now that you've repeated that back, um, that doesn't sound fine. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I've done that a lot with like AMA blocks. It's like, you know, cool, what's your plan? And they'll say their plan. And i am like, all right, you know, um, so this is what I heard you say. And then when I refer it back from like kind of a clinical approach, they'll be like, yeah, that sounds ridiculous. And it's like, it kind of does, you know, let's, let's see how we can adjust that. Um, so I think getting them to share the experience of like how everything is fine. And then if you notice they're keeping a very surface level, just asking questions that helps it go uh, deeper than that. And then hopefully the inside of them saying, oh, wow, this is not fine. Um, or you just asking questions or pointing out things enough to where they come to the aha moment of like, okay, well, this is, this is not fine. So, um, and I see use EMDR to get to trauma. I think EMDR is an amazing tool um, and it works. You know, it's not, it's not a fit for everybody because of like dissociation and things like that. But um, <clears throat> one of the challenges with EMDR and addiction is just um, early recovery. You know, EMDR is amazing. I've got a lot of friends that do EMDR therapy and, um, but it, it's the timing of it, you know, especially like if it's in a short, short term program, fresh out of detox, uh, from people that actually do MDR, because I don't, but um, the people I've talked to, it's like, man, like this person would be great. But, like they're just not clear enough to do it. Um, so EMDR works. It's just if the person's a fit and the timing of it's appropriate and also having enough time to see it through. We had another question pop up in the Q&A portion that just uh, that I did want to address and not just answer, but it says, can a client enter either of your facilities if they don't have a substance abuse problem, but they but just trauma. So we are both, both programs are substance abuse primary. So please feel free to reach out to either one of us. If you need trauma treatment or your client needs trauma treatment, we're happy mm -hmm. to get you connected to resources. But as far as with us, we're, we're substance abuse and then everything kind of secondary. 